Hello everyone. Today I am joined by uh, Ms. Mahua Acharya. Uh, she is uh, the founder and uh, CEO of Intent Platform. What were the challenges which the cities and the states posed as the biggest hurdles for adopting electric vehicles in general? And what were the innovations which actually led them to believe in the technology and to uh, believe in the paradigm shift from owning conventional buses to now uh, running the service, buying the service in general. The government had already allocated budget. It so happened that by the time I entered the system, the, we found that the budget had not been utilized. So it was then changed to a service model. Yeah. And in that service model, um, the only way to get scale was to aggregate demand. But what does that mean when you're converting this into a service model? It means that states have to sign up to certain terms and conditions that otherwise they were happily doing on their own, which is why, like you were saying earlier, there were different prices for the same bus in different cities. So it took some time to convince states to say, come into this joint exercise. When we finally got scale, we got five and a half thousand in the first, first round, we found that, wow, the prices are now lower. So what turned, what was initially one of the, mo the harder challenges mm. turned out to be in fact quite an enticing thing because we've got prices that are now cheaper than diesel and provided states manage to keep up this trend, many of our state transport undertakings may well actually come out into the black. And I would like eventually for this country to grow up into a system where infrastructure capital is able to come in into the provision of public transport, where the role of the government is to provide to its users high quality transport services right. at bus stops that are available near your home right. uh, in as many areas, even if they're not lucrative. That's the objective of public enterprise. And the objective of private enterprise is in fact to do all of that, but the terms and conditions are such that the private enterprise makes money and the state enterprise loses less money. What do you suggest the smaller cities should do to be better equipped with such kind of such levels of procurement? So procurement was done by a centralized agency. That was us doing that procurement and I still maintain that the only way to get scale is to have the procurement and program management entity to be different from each of the states. That's the only way and this right. is, should be a neutral entity hmm. working in the interest of the industry. Selection of nine was largely to do with population. And it so happened that they, we have our large metros in there and therefore because of that our capacity is a bit higher in these, in these metro cities and the utilities in these metro cities. Now what should they do to benefit? For one, it is very clear that they must move to electric. Not just because right. our import bills are so high, but as I demonstrated it is, it is cheaper than diesel. Capacity. I think one big, big issue we have to handle and not just the smaller cities, it's even the current cities. The fur. The way the contracts were delivered and designed is changes the role of the state counterpart. It changes the role of the utility, whose previous role was to own things and manage things. Now their job is to manage a contract. Their mind has to think a little differently around how do I move from being uh, an entity with staff, with people, with processes, with certain businesses, certain um, certain business needs to now becoming a contract management enterprise and on both sides in order for them to also be completely convinced that we've got to move over to a con become a contract manager I think one also should review today as we speak in 2025 this is year three of the bus program most buses are about two years old now perhaps it's time to do a little review of how is it working uh, what can be changed it's a two-way, this is a two-way street. So capacity, uh, I won't say capacity building, I, th I would say just a repurposing of the workforce, a re certainly a repurposing of the systems are needed. And there's one last piece that I might say that as a country we should do is, is digitizing. The production linked incentives of the PLI scheme which the government has, uh, you know, 
released in 2022. My question to you would be, how do you think these schemes still lack somewhere and what, what benefits are they bringing onto the table? I must promise you that building something from scratch, manufacturing takes a lot longer than, sure. than pulling out a contract and running a tender. In the development of these other schemes that right. run in parallel, because it right. is a given, it is an imperative, and it's in a way a certain responsibility on ourselves to our own citizens that we produce locally um, at quality, at very high quality, and I know we can do that. So it takes time. Do you see these models being replicated elsewhere globally? I would like other countries to benefit from this program. We're in discussions with Mexico, we're in discussions with Brazil, I've been in discussions with the government of Nigeria. There have been queries that have come in from Indonesia, from South Africa, and of course several small countries. But remember, our program was designed for big countries. Well, it was designed for us, so it's applicable also for the big countries. If smaller countries are able to take it and adapt it, that's great.